Hi, everyone. My name is Crystal, and today um, we're going to have Dr. Brendan Gallagher as our speaker on our Dental Shadowers platform. I would like to take this time to thank Dr. Gallagher for coming on our platform and talking to all of us as pre dental students. And whenever you're ready, you can take it away. Thank you so much, Crystal. Thank you. And thank you all for, for joining tonight. I hope I can really, you know, uh, mentor, educate, motivate, and help with any personal questions as far as I, I can. Okay, so let's jump right into this presentation. It's been two years since I presented this. I just updated my, my credentials over here. I'm a third year resident uh, currently in Manhattan. I am um, at NYU and Bellevue's oral maxillofacial surgery program. I went to Stony Brook Dental School. Got the little hat right over here. <laughs> Um, let's see on the right side, you can find me on Instagram at Dr. Gallagher. And by the way, Crystal, call me Brendan, call me Brendan. You don't have to worry about the formalities. Um, also on TikTok and, and YouTube and podcast. And I've been really getting involved on LinkedIn, by the way, I highly recommend for after dental school and you're looking at jobs, LinkedIn is going to the place when recruiters find you most. So that's for a little, little hint for later on. Okay. Next, uh, Residency application process, and um, among other things, oral surgery is the specialty of dentistry that is really kind of the bridge between medicine and dentistry within healthcare alone. Reason being is because in residency, this is a four to six year specialty where um, you're, it's a hospital based residency, right? So you're interacting, you're doing rotations with the other, with other special specialists within medicine, uh, general surgery, um, head and neck plastic surgery, hand surgery, bariatric surgery, medicine. I did rotations in MICU. That's the medical ICU. In two months, I'll be in SICU. That's the surgical ICU. In three months, I'll be in the ED. So I'll be a full-on ED, uh, emergency room, ER resident. Um, so it's it's interesting. This is not stuff I, I knew entirely prior to the application process. So, so that's why I try and put out videos on like the daily life and stuff. Okay. You have the... Specialty placement, uh, th this is as far as a dental student applying to oral surgery, right? You want to look at the placement history of every dental school that you're applying to, I recommend, because different dental schools have different match percentages into each specialty. For example, NYU's dental school, they have 400 students a year. A handful place into oral surgery specifically every year. I came from Stony Brook. There was 44 students in our class. Again, a handful placed into matched into oral surgery. Look at the percentages, right? That is also typical for UConn, for Harvard, for Columbia. They are very, they're smaller. So they match a lot into these specialties, okay? Something can, to consider, right? Uh, class rank, GPA, always important. CBSC score, the CBSC is the admissions uh, exam, kind of like the DAT, if you will, for dental school. The CBAC is the admissions exam for oral surgery residency, okay? that's It's only for oral surgery, not for ortho or peds. Letters of recommendation are good. Externships, extremely important. Could go on to that la uh, later if you'd like. Um, and again, this is what I meant by uh, the placement history, right? And it's only approximation. You could always bridge the gap, right? Okay, class ranking. I went over that. Uh, these are kind of going into the outline. Uh, the CBSC exam, it's only offered twice a year, usually end of July and early February, okay? You have to schedule three to five months out. Um, the exam closes about one month out, so you do need to plan that early. You need to plan that in advance. You're allowed six attempts to take that. It's 200 questions. There are four sections of 50 questions. Uh, there is a half time about, at about 100 questions. I wouldn't go into that too too in depth. You want to get that test over with, right? Five and a half hours, similar to the DAT in some areas, right? Um, typically a good score is above 70. We're getting closer to 75 now. And yes, it takes a few months to study for this thing. Okay. And we could go into study tips, recommendations, strategies, when to take it, how to take it, how to plan the application around taking that test. If you'd like letters of recommendation, these are letters that you get, you have letters of recommendation from de into dental school as well. So you know that we don't have to go into that too in depth. I really want to get to Q and A so I can address any questions directly. Okay, um, externships they're not required, but they are preferred, and I highly recommend doing them. What is an externship? It's a one week shadowing experience or observing experience. Sometimes they even allow you to do procedures with them, maybe assist 
in the OR, right? In externship, you spend one week at an oral and maxillofacial surgery program. Okay. Uh, you have to reach out to the, usually the program coordinators. You can find it on our website, reach out via email or call. I like to get in person. So I would always call and see about their um, availabilities. The magic number of externships to get is three. If you could get more, very good. But generally, you want to get right around three. Okay. Extra net reach programs. What does this mean? You know, when you're applying to college, you're like, well, they usually accept an SAT of this and I have this. I'm going to go for it anyway, right? I recommend externing because you could extern anywhere, right? I recommend externing at reach schools. Re reason being, a reach school is somewhere you don't necessarily think you might get accepted to, right? If you extern there and they really like you, you just got yourself an interview at, at a program you didn't expect. If they don't like you, well, you didn't expect to get one anyway. So, so you see what I'm saying? It's like, it's not really a lose. It's really a win-win for you, Okay. Uh, program corner is good research, not required. I know a lot of students, a lot of students, literally hundreds a year ask me, do you need research to apply to oral surgery residencies? No, you don't. Um, my analogy that I always like to use to this question is, um, I had 14, 15 interviews after that two oral surgery programs and eight of them asked me about playing the violin. I included that. I, I play the violin on my, um, resume. I also included that I did research and what the research was in. We, we applied lasers to the implant surface um, in order to kind of like to look at the temperature changes. Because when you have a temperature change, change of about 10 degrees within a minute causes necrosis of the bone, right? Um, it, de de it degrades the collagen in the, the bone surrounding the implant. No one asked me, like one program asked about research. Eight of them asked me about um, playing the violin. So I always like to suggest put stuff about your, your unique personality on your resume and your application, because that's what the residency directors, attendings, even for dental school, this is the stuff they're going to point out. And then, oh my God, you know, like someone loves skiing or fishing or playing the piano. They're going to talk about that forever. This is how you connect, right? And it makes the interview, it, it helps them remember you too, right? If you go over test scores and research, you kind of blend into the pack a little bit. You want to stand out, Okay. A DFS, this is just a website that, that they have you use to apply to residencies in, okay? I'm not going to go into this too in-depth. Just interviews, uh, they go out between August and December. Um, and then match day is in the middle of January. So, yes, you literally have a month. You submit your rank list, and then you wait a month, and then match day is in the middle to the end of January. And um, essentially, you rank your favorite schools from one to however many interviews you get. The school, the program, does the same thing. They rank one through X of their applicants, the people they interviewed, right? And then the pass system, the match system takes them all and they say it's in the resident's favor, but they match one to one, two to one, two, um, and place everyone. So it's a surprise, literally, on match day morning when you get that email saying where you're going for the next four to six years if it's oral surgery. That's match day right there. Okay, this is me on, uh, wow, this is two years ago. Isn't that funny? Wow. That, that was my Instagram two years ago. It's, it's a bit more developed now and a lot more content on there and, and fun. That's my grandma. So uh, she, so just a side note, um, I, she, uh, she passed away actually a week or two after match day, but she found out that I got into NYU and she was there for me the whole way. I used to go to visit her during dental school to play the violin for her and my grandfather while she was sick. And um so I, I now, wow, it's been two years since I've, I've presented this PowerPoint. It's just, <laughs> all right. Anyway, let's move on. Let's go into a Q&A session. How can I, let me, uh, how do I end, end the sharing? So I, so I can yeah. go over the questions so that way you could just directly answer. So that way it's sure. easier for you. Um, so we got a bunch of questions. So I'll just start from the beginning. Um, so the first one is, was Stony Brook your first choice dental school? And did you know you wanted to specialize before you started dental school? Or was that something you learned on later? Learned later on, sorry. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, great question. Yes, I, so I applied to six schools. I interviewed at five. The six schools were Stony Brook, um, NYU, Toro, Buffalo, Rutgers, and Florida. Um, I don't know if you know, Florida takes like 90 per 95 percent in state, whatever. I didn't get an interview there. That's fine. I have family down there. That's why the other five I interviewed out. Um, I did get accepted into all of them and I ended up picking Stony Brook because um, 
smaller class size. I, I know some of the faculty there actually, well, he started during my early end of first year, end of second year. So I didn't at the time actually, but um, it was close to home. Again, my grandmother was sick. It was a chance for me to small class size. They have an excellent match rate into specialties. Right. And I, I did think that I wanted to specialize. I shadowed cosmetic dentists, general dentists, a couple general dentists. Um, I knew endodontists. I've heard a pediatric dentist wasn't so thrilled about working with kids, to be honest. <laughs> and um, I also shadowed an oral surgeon that just really caught my my ambition and interest. Right. So I, I knew I was interested in specializing. I did want to keep my eyes open because no one really likes a, a dental student that goes in like, oh, I'm so I was super focused and motivated for it, but I wasn't necessarily like 100%. That's it. You know what I mean? Very important thing. What's the next question? It's um, how should, how do you be a good intern and what types of externs do you see um, residents or attendings like to see? Uh, a, a good intern. Unfortunately, intern is a lot of call, a lot of little task work. Uh, sometimes they'll have you covering and, and doing clinics. So you are taking out teeth, you are doing procedures in the clinic. Um, actually here, what we do is we uh, we basically teach dental students in the clinic here. At, 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 hmm. I know I mentioned in the beginning, we'll cut this at the end, but because of the program's policies, we'll cut out the program that I in the beginning. We'll worry about that later. But the public hospital that, that we're in, we have a clinic there. So as an intern, you're covering that clinic. You're teaching dental students. You're working directly with patients doing procedures. It's great. A lot of tasks, though. To be an excellent intern, in my opinion, um, it's basically just doing do, listening, doing what you're told, asking questions, asking a lot of the right questions. There, unfortunately, are some not so you have to understand that time is very limited all the time. There's always like time for one thing and there's three things to do all the time. Right. So unfortunately it's not necessarily they're dumb questions. There are times to ask things, times not to ask things because you got to move. Right. Um, you could be rounding anywhere between, I mean, at other programs that we were around before five o'clock sometimes um, here generally rounds are between five thirty and seven. Um, yes. Yeah, so being a good, hardworking, strong intern is doing all your tasks with being efficient, being effective at the work that you're given. Um, something I'm still working on is getting to meetings, rounds, lectures, conferences, 15 minutes early. That's that's a big thing. And when you're on externships, that's a huge thing. Go to, get to everything 15 minutes early. And I would stay until everyone's there. Everyone's ready to go, right? I'm still working on that because it's also like, you, <laughs> you'll know this when you get there you're always balancing how much sleep and rest you get. And then like preparing for surgery, maybe at the end of the week, next week, you know, there's always three things going on. So it's a balance between all of them. I always try to utilize as much time as you have, but um, yes. The other question was. Um, um, part what two. Types of externs do residents and attendings like to see? Yes. Externs. Uh, my thing was, is there anything I could do to help with this? Do you want me to pull up those models? Can I assist you for this? You need someone to suction. I would always try like, hey, do you want me to run that to the other room for you so you could stay here? It's really just lending an extra hand. Always be willing to lend an extra hand. I've been asked several times over the last couple of years because I do a lot of mentoring as such. Um, they, they always ask me, uh, do you need to know the procedure of how to do a Lafort and this and that? I'm like, no, it's, it's nice, right? That would be great if you know procedures, techniques, of certain surgeries. However, no one expects an, an extern to know that, right? You're a dental student. It's really just having a good attitude, always being motivated, being there, again, always being there with an open hand to lend an extra hand and help out wherever it can be needed. Uh, the next question is, how do you preserve your back? Oh, my favorite thing are planks. Does anyone here do planks? I know everyone's got their most Mostly everyone's got their screen off, but maybe just a hand, you can hit the hand button. Yeah, you do, you do blanks, you do planks. You know, like when you hold it up, planks are huge. I would recommend do, working on your lower back, not high weight, but high reps, right? Doing the correct form. Again, not medical advice. This is my own sole personal opinion. You always have to include that, right? But um, planks are really good because they they really strengthen your core right? They allow you to hold positions for certain, for very long. 
amount of time. Some people ask me about compression socks. I don't know. I run a lot. I think that works on your circulation. And I think that's really important when you're in the OR for 10, 12 hours. Um, work, working on your back. Be very conscient. Stretching, yoga. I like to do squat thrusts where you hold, or burpees. Some people on burpees when you hold dumbbells in your hands. That really strengthens your core. Ab workouts for the core. Um, I think those are several ideas to help you with your back. You really want to be conscientious with your back. You really do. One of my attendings sits down for procedures. Typically, oral surgeons stand up. I like to stand up for now. When I have a little more time, maybe I'll I'll implement sitting down because um, it does seem to be true that he's got a longer career than some oral surgeons that I know. Um, the next question is, while research is not required to match, do residents have to do research? Here, we are required to do a research project. I thought of maybe trying, I I don't know if I'm going to do this. I'm looking into it. I wanted to do something a little bit unorthodox, a little bit different, where I was thinking, I don't know if you know this, but insurance companies, Medicaid, procedures that specifically oral surgeons, but all dentists have done, Medicaid and other insurance companies have not increased reimbursement rates in rough in years, like 20 years. Inflation, as we all know, is going like this, right? And, you know, things get more expensive. Um, salaries go go up at a, at a small rate. Inflation is going up at a large rate um, in certain circumstances. However, procedures aren't being reimbursed at an increasing rate to match salary basis, to match, you know, what patients pay for procedures. When it's not, when it's fee for service, when it's not insurance based, what patients are paying, insurance companies aren't matching that. They don't cover implants most of the time. Um so what I was thinking, why don't we research what are Medicaid reimbursing throughout the United States? I would, it would be nice to get most of the states and figure out what was it 20 years ago? What was it 30 years ago? What was it 10 years ago? Five years ago, right? If we could do five-year intervals, we could get an idea of that trend. Is it going up? Is it stagnant? We know it in, what, when, you know, the, um, what inflation rate are and, and salary basis and stuff. We know that it is going up. Why aren't doctors being reimbursed for the procedures that they're doing? And why aren't they paying for procedures that patients need? Um, it, it's a question that I'd like to see addressed, right? Because I think um, personally, I'd like to see healthcare really build in the right direction while I'm in it. Uh, the next question is, when should we start studying for the CBSE? I would recommend taking once. So remember, you have six tries. Take it once before you start studying for it. Throughout dental school, the majority of your exams are dental school-based. Some programs, uh, Stony Brook, we take almost a year with the medical students. Harvard takes like two years with medical students. Columbia takes a year and a half with, with medical students. So those schools generally get some exposure to medical school exams, step, et cetera. Dental schools, NYU, you get like no exposure to the CBSC because it's a medically, it's a medical school board exam based test, right? I recommend taking that test once. It's a monster. Get an idea of what that monster looks at before you try and size it up, right? Take it after D1 year. That's the first try. Then plan it out. When you're looking to study for it, I would a lot, at least three or four months, at least. Maybe you take it in February. Remember, it's only over twice a year. So it's about end of July and then early February. Then maybe you take it in February. Okay. If not, maybe you take it after D2 year. I took it after D1 year without studying for it. Got an idea. Then I waited, I studied for it. I took it after D2 year. I got I got a score I could apply with, but I didn't get the score I want. And then I took it February of D3 year now. Still didn't get the score I wanted, but I got the score I needed. I applied with that and I, you know, but um, so I took it three times, two times studying for it. I recommend taking it first, again, after D1 year, see what it is. Then you could take it during D2 year, that's fine. Now is when you start studying for it, okay? And if you think about it, if you take it once after D1 year, that's one time. Take it during D2 year, that's two times. Take it after D2 year. Take it during D3 year. Take it after D3 year. God forbid, if you didn't get the score you need by now, you can still take it a fifth time and you haven't run out of tries yet. And no, they're not looking at how many times you've taken the CBSC. They're not. They have so many applications to go through. They're not looking at that stuff, okay? Um, does their score expire? I think it does expire. Not while you're in dental school. As far as I know, it, it's it's like you got plenty of time. I just saw that that question just went into the chat. 
Um, the next one is, how do you recommend us to find chatting opportunities as a pre-dental student? I tried emailing dental offices, but no response. Offices are busy. I would go to the office. I would present in person, presentable, you know, hey, what's going on? I go to University of Virginia, I don't know, and and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in, in dentistry. Uh, would you mind, I would come, come in with, maybe bring breakfast, maybe bring, uh, you know, a fruit basket. I don't know, something cute, just, just so that they can... You know, it's presentable. It's nice. It's welcoming, and and you can. Uh, it's friendly. And then you say, hey, can I can I speak with your dentist by any chance? Does does he allow students to shadow? Would it be okay if I could just ask him a few questions, maybe? Um, and then ask a few questions. Hey, you know, I saw that. You know, what 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 do you what procedures do you do? What are your working hours? And then you could kind of say like, okay. Um, and then ask like, do you allow students to shadow? I'm you know, I don't want to interrupt your day. I was just wondering if I could come in on a day. Maybe we plan. Can I get your email, phone number, whatever it may be? Get their contact, reach out to them, plan a date, go there, and go from there. Okay. I found the most of the dentists I shadowed, four, three or four of them I met at the gym, believe it or not. And then by meeting people, talking with them uh, between family, for, I have no dentist in my family, so I didn't know where to start either. I just started talking to people like, yeah, I think I'm interested in medical school or PA or dentistry. I don't know. And then all of a sudden, like, hey, you should talk to that guy. He's a dentist. <laughs> so I went over and said, Hi, uh, taking organic chemistry in the fall. Uh, any any tips? <laughs> oh, I got an A in that. Come here, read this book. <laughs> That's literally how it happened, believe it or not. It was funny. Uh, the next question is, why dentistry? Dentistry is a very unique profession. What I love about dentistry is, you know, you, have, you still have mom and pop shops, uh, like, uh, in office owned by the dentist that runs it, you know, or partners in the dental practice that run it and work there. And I, what I love about dentistry is that they get really into the community. You know, it's like you treat mom, you treat dad, if they like you, maybe you treat little Susie. I'll be taking out little Susie's wisdom teeth when she's 19. You know, I could forward her to my buddy, Sean, who's an orthodontist for braces, you know, or he'll be referring to me vice versa. Little Susie's grandmother might need an implant. And you meet, then you meet Abuelo and <laughs> the grandfather and say, you know, I, I love that. I really like, I'm a family oriented guy. I really like to network and speak. Obviously, you know, I, I'll talk your off all night if you like. And um, I, I really want to get into a community. I want to be working for the people of that community. And that's personal why I like it. Many people say dentists have a better work-life balance than medicine. I a thousand percent agree with that. I couldn't agree more. And medicine is really getting taken over by hospital systems such that doctors now, for the most part, unless you're specializing in ortho, plastic surgery, dermatology, among a couple other things, even anesthesiology is is like 50-50. I would say maybe I could be wrong. General numbers. Um really being taken out over by hospitals, right? Which means you don't work for yourself anymore. You work for them. When you work for someone else, as you know, in a corporate environment, you lose a little bit of autonomy. You do more work for them than you do for you or your patient, right? For example, um, an anesthesiologist at we're in a hospital, it's like, oh no, you have to do one more case today. That's it. And it's like, wait, I'm, I'm not prepared for this though, whatever, just, just for one example. But when you work for a hospital on a salary basis, you have less negotiating power. You know, you have less stance in that, in that, um, decision-making capabilities. You know what I mean? As far as that goes, that makes sense. In dentistry, you have more of an opportunity to work for yourself. And when I say work for yourself, I mean, working for the patient. And that is why I went into dentistry. Uh, the next question is, could you describe a challenging case or situation you've encountered during your journey that solidified your commitment to the specialty? Oh, wow. This is a very good question. A, a uh, Is it in the chat just so I can read it again? It's a difficult uh, yeah. situation that solidified your passion for the specialty. Oh, yes. Okay. Literally, uh, this is one or two months ago. Um, I, I was just talking about this on TikTok the other day where... The general dental residents, GPR, um, they called me in our, one of the, a tooth got lodged into a tooth root. The tooth came out, there was a tooth stuck and it right up into the left maxillary sinus and it was stuck up there. They took an x-ray, they see it, can't get it out. They don't know what to do. And uh, they called in one of our first year residents who couldn't get it. They called me in um, third year now. And 
what what I ended up doing was, so it's great. Now we have a whole team working on an issue, right? And the patient's been there for, I don't know, an hour and a half, two hours, uh, you know, like sitting there in the chair, getting them re because the numbness starts to wear off a little bit, right? The lidocaine. So what we ended up doing is we took two x-rays, one from behind, one from the front to kind of get a spatial arrangement of where it is in the maxillary sinus, right? In respect to the root sockets, okay? Then I went in with a curette, scooping around up there, just guessing based on what I saw on the x-ray. And then a curette is like a spoon, right? And it's got a weird thing that like comes out and then it goes over. So I put it in a maxillary molar has three roots. So it's like this, there's one on the inside, one on the inside, and then two on the outside. The two on the outside had very little bone in between the sinus where the root went into, right? Then the one behind it, also had very little bone in between the sinus. The sinus is like a hole in the bone where there's mucus. Uh, if you have a cold, it fills up with mucus and fluid and stuff. Um, I, ended, I, I ended up going in the back, pushing the root out to the front, down into the root socket. We got it out. But regardless of the procedure to address the question that you asked was that I love working in the team environment like this. You know, it wasn't about me getting it out necessarily. I like to include how we ended up getting it out, but we did it as a team, you know, and everyone needed to be there. Um, that, that I love the teamwork and I like, I like uh, camaraderie like that um, to solve problems, share stories, educate each other, mentor each other, motivate to get the job done. Uh, the next question is what is the lowest class rank you can match with? Um, so that would be predicated that your dental school is ranked. Not all dental schools are ranked. Uh, I know and some dental schools are even pass fail, believe it or not. That really helps. I know Columbia is pass fail. I think it is ranked, however. Harvard, I don't know if it's ranked. It's pass fail as well. Uh, Stony Brook, not ranked, but it's not pass fail. We have pass fail, we have grades. Um, NYU is graded, it's ranked. It's a mess. It's an, I've got the stress at these schools that are ranking students. When, now I get it, right? Because but I think it's teaching students to compare themselves to everyone else. You know, it's not you against everyone else, but that's literally what these schools are telling you. I'm, I'm not a fan of that. Um, the lowest rank, I don't know. I don't know if anyone else would, I don't know if anyone would be able to give you that live. That's live data that only program directors know. If they have every programs, you see what I'm saying? If they have every, every program's data, but it's not out there and it's not readily available. Uh, the next one is a two-part question. I'll just ask the first part first. Um, I'm really concerned about networking and also becoming a dental assistant. In Illinois, it's not necessary to be certified, but how do I ask a dentist to come and start working there? Well, you just ask the question. Go find that dentist, meet them in person, maybe bring a fruit basket, some bagels, uh, maybe a platter of cookies. Oh my God, that would get me. Brownies. Brownies. And then... And then um, um, you know, you go there and then, oh, there's a little, little, uh, interference. It's, it's all good. So, um, go there, talk to them, introduce yourself, let them know where you're at. You know, I'm a dental assistant. I'm, I'm super excited. If I could, do you have any openings at your office? If they don't, do you know anyone that might have openings in their office? Right. All dentists have other dentists friends. Let me tell you, someone might be looking for them. And I know right now many offices are looking for, assistants, nurses, surgical assistants, receptionists, all over the place, managers. Yeah, they're out there. Uh, second part is um, what's the difference between an intern and an extern? An extern is a dental student spending one week at a residency program to observe, to learn, to see what the program's like, to test it out. It's also an opportunity for the program to test you out. An intern is a first-year resident of an oral maxillofacial surgery program for one year. Now, to make it a little more comp, so that extern is a dental student externing for one week, a tryout, if you will, at that school. An intern is already at the program for one year. Now, to make it a little more confusing, you have a categorical intern and a non-categorical intern or a non-cat internship, right? The difference is a non-cat is a non-categorical resident. They're not a matriculated resident at that program. They're only there for one year. And in that process, they're usually going to reapply to oral surgery programs for the following year, right? They weren't accepted there for residents. It's just a one-year internship, okay? It's like a helping hint. You're an intern there, but just for one year. A categorical intern is one who, you know, you've been accepted into the program. You're going to be there for four to six years and so on. 
Uh, the next one is how do you proceed asking for a letter recommendation? Asking, um, you got to go in. And, so it was very difficult for me for our year. That was smack in the middle of COVID. It was 2020. And what I ended up having to do was all of us with the school shut down for a couple of months. We had to email or I, I tried to text if I, so, so think of it top down, right? And I would also recommend this for undergrad letters of rec or reaching out to a dentist to shadow or to work at a dentist's office, all the above. Think of how can you really connect with someone? Well, go and talk with them in person. If it's not COVID era, go, go and speak with that doctor in person. Maybe go assist for them in the oral surgery clinic. If you're a dental student one day, say hello. Hey, can I help out? With By the way, you know, this year, I've really appreciated our time together, you know, and you've always inspired me and, and taught me so many things about how to take out teeth, how to inject someone and give an IAN block, um, so on and so forth, right? You know, I really appreciated our time together. Would you mind, if you have the time, writing a letter of recommendation for me? I would really appreciate having um, your words of wisdom in this application and being a part of my application process, something like that. Right. Because now it's like you've, you've developed a relationship with that attending uh, with that um, in dental school, the doctors in the clinic there. Um, they would really appreciate that, you know, and it's someone you connected with. It's got to be someone that knows you. Does that make sense? Um, I would approach them in person. If it's COVID era, if you have their phone number, I would text them, call them. I would call. If you can't call, they don't pick up whatever, leave voicemail, whatever. Text them. If not, email if you don't have their phone number. Right. That makes sense. Um, the next one is what does the OR look like and what uh, types of professionals are working in the surgery during the surgeries? Sure, sure. So most surgeries are done by surgeons. Um, OB-GYN is all, they also do, oh, they do so many surgeries and they deliver babies and whatnot. Um, then there's an anesthesia. So, so in OR versus the clinic operating rooms, like in an oral surgery clinic or in a, even in a dental operatory, general dentist, right? That's the most anesthesia that's generally delivered there is IV sedation. It's a deep sedation or moderate sedation. Max sedation is the literal term as far as anesthesia goes. There's no breathing tube put in. There's no ET tube, right? Endotracheal tube. That's safe for the OR. This, what I'm talking about is in clinic, when they give you IV sedations, take out your wisdom teeth or maybe do a, a procedure in there. Um, so that's in the clinic. So the OR or operating room of a hospital is now you have two parties. You have the surgery team and then you have the anesthesia team because here they do lighter sedations, max sedation, deep sedation, but it's, ge it's usually GA, general anesthesia, where they put a breathing tube in. They, they can put it through the nose. They can put it down your throat. Um, oral surgery residents spend five to six months throughout their course of residency on anesthesia. So for my, for my like second or third through the like eighth or ninth month of residency, I was a full on anesthesia resident. I was in the, in the room alone, intubating patients, waking them up, extubating patients. Intubating is when you put the breathing tube in, right? They've been fully induced. And then you have a short amount of time because they've stopped breathing, right? That's how much medication you give them to fall asleep, take away the pain, cause a brief memory lapse with benzodiazepines, midazolam, for example, fentanyl, take away the pain. I could go on. Um, you have a very short amount of time before they desat, desaturation of oxygen content in the blood. You got to put that tube in, right? You got to get them on the machine, help them breathe and whatnot. Um, so that's full on anesthesia tests. And then once they're fully under anesthesia, then surgeons can begin. You have different, so you have, I mean, I don't know if the other part of that question was the type of surgeon. You, you could Google surgeons out there, but does that make sense? All are in the hospital generally, um, anesthesia team to induce patient, get them on, under anesthesia. And then you have, then the surgery team preps with beta dime prep or other solutions and they begin the surgery. Um, next one is how do you protect your uh, mental health in dental school and residency? Did you feel like you did a good job balancing school and life in undergrad or was it something you had to work on to improve? <laughs> well, I haven't graduated yet, guys. I don't know if I've I've succeeded in residency just yet. <laughs> it's it's tough. Mental health is is the most important thing. It really is. If you don't have your mental health, it's like you don't have your foundation on it, you know? Um, and it's interesting because dental school is extremely academic intensive, right? 
they say compared to undergrad, it's the equivalent of 32 credits a semester. That's dental school. And then throughout dental school, you're ta- you, you reduce the amount of classes that you're taking, and then they add in all clinic time. You're treating patients on top of that, this and that. And they've only reduced the amount of classes a little bit. It's it's more just like, here's some more problems, but we know you can handle the other ones. So here's some more, right? Residency is a little different. Now, it's less academic. It's more clinic-based. It's so much work. It's so much time in the hospital, treating patients, planning things. There's so much work going, and task work. It's mostly task work, paperwork, behind the scenes That's that that you don't really see on the outside. That's why I make TikToks to kind of portray what's going on behind the scenes. Um, I've had to modify that over the last nine months to, to make sure the, you know, HIPAA is one thing I've never gone near that, but the institution's rules are another thing, right? So, um, the experience, I try to tell as much about the experience as I can, but, um, yes. So so mental health, how do you deal with mental health, all that going on? And you see what I mean? It's all academic heavy. It's it's another ball game compared to undergrad dental school. And then it's a whole nother ball game because it's less academic. And now you're like, you're in front of pay. So many, you know, 50, 60, sometimes 75 patients in a day. If you're an intern, you're on call overnight. Now you're doing potentially upwards of 30, 35, 40 hours in a row of working. That's a different kind of mental health pressure and stress. And, you know, it's physical. That's that's very physical. Dental school, I'm sure you can understand. That's, that's not so physical as much residency is. It's entirely work, a lot of hand stuff. So, again, let's go back to the mental health. You need to understand how, what, what are your coping mechanisms? What do you use to kind of d- distract yourself, to disconnect? Disconnect from technology is one thing. How do you disconnect from school? How do you disconnect from the hospital, from residency? Um, there are different methods. Personally, what I like to do is I really like to get my priorities straight and I got to clear things off the list. So I use the app to do, it's by Microsoft. DM me on Instagram. We could go into stuff later or now, if you really want me to get into it. It's a to-do app. It's a calendar. It's a to-do list. It's even a fold. You can put folders of what you need to do in different subjects, different patients, different hospitals, different cl- clinics, et cetera. Um, I like to organize stuff. I need to clear stuff out of my mind at the end of the day, make sure we've hit all the tasks. Everyone's doing this, right? In dental school, there's a lot going on. You In undergrad, I would write everything out and I'd rewrite it every day. You might not have that time in dental school and you do not have that time to do that in residency. So using the app, you would just type it up. You could put everything in for the next day. You don't have to t- rewrite it every day. It saves time. You just click a button and then everything that you have on a daily repeat, you could do weekly repeat. You could do every Monday repeat. You could do every first Sunday of the month on repeat and it just pops up in your to-do list. It's spectacular. Cross everything out, organize things based on priorities, knock it off the list. And you'll see this, the stress in dental school, you need to be able to prioritize everything because not everything needs to be done right now, today, even this week, Put it on the list, but remember, those can be, wait, you need to address what needs to be done now. Now, once the day's test, now we can disconnect. That's why I brought that up because now we can disconnect. I love to exercise. Just before, 15 minutes before the call, I just finished exercising. A little, did a little trap and chest workout Uh, in the basement of the apartment here. We have a little fitness center. So I was able to go down there. We got a little treadmill. We only have dumbbells up to 50, but you know, you make it work, right? Yesterday I went for a run. I like to go out, I get some fresh air, just get away, go to the track, run, do abs. Um, I think disconnecting from the workplace, the work environment, disconnecting from whatever that intensive, or maybe it's a very friendly culture, but you still need your personal time. You need to, and throughout dental school, you learn to make time for your personal time, make time for yourself, make time for your friends, family. It's very important to kind of designate a certain time for that. Um, what's another thing after exams, I would either, I would go right, right to the gym or to visit my grandma, my grandparents and play the violin for them. Keep in touch with those things that you did growing up, whether it's knitting or cooking. A lot of people in dental school cooked. That was their time for themselves and they're literally feeding themselves, you know? So it's like feeding your mind feeding your body. And I, I really believe in that. I don't know how to cook. <laughs> you don't want me to try and cook. I might burn this place down. <laughs> but uh, so, so keep, keep prioritize your hobbies. What really allows you to disconnect mentally and physically from the workplace, prioritize them and always make sure you have a little time every day, every week, 
every month for your thing, whatever that thing is, right? And hold, hold on to that thing. Maybe it's cooking. Maybe it's, there was an attending who was actually the program director of VCU. He, he, he did a, he was a chef. Like he literally took cooking classes and he was like, um, he said he was in, he was specializing in, I don't know, like cooking. I, I don't know what the word is, in, in Asian cooking. And like, what? Put that on your resume. That's what everyone's going to ask you about on the interview, believe it or not, right? Stick to it through dental school, through residency, through college, whatever it may be. Put it on your resume and watch and see what happens. Uh, the next one is, what are your plans after residency, private practice, academics, associate, and why? Yeah, I, I would really like to get into private practice. Um, the autonomy stuff really plays into it big. I want to get into the community, right? And I really don't like taking hospital call. I've found that out. I like working directly for the patients. So I want to work in private practice. I'll take call for the practice for the patients that go there helping out the dentists in the area, something emergency. Oh, good. I'll call, I'll call the assistant. Let's get in. Let's open it up. Let's see the patient. Let's address the, the fractured tooth, the infection, whatever it may be. Let's get it done. Um, you can't do that in a hospital setting, right? It, you, you're working for the hospital at that point. I want to work for the patient. I think that's best done in a private practice setting. Again, just my personal opinion. Um, so that's, that's really what I want to do. Wisdom teeth, sedations, implants, big implant cases, zygomatic implants. This is the zygoma, the cheekbone. That's the zygoma. They're the implants. If you don't know about these days, they go into the zygomas from here and then they support a denture, a prosthesis, et cetera. Um, I really like those big cases. They can be done in a private practice office. That's where I want it to be done. And that way I could really get in touch with the community that way. Uh, the next one is, did you consider any other dental specialties besides oral surgery? Oh, great question. Great, great question. Not really. <laughs> I I had my mind open to it and I was like, um, no, no, kids. Oh, believe it or not, we have pediatrics residencies here. We have GPR residencies and GPR is start. We've covered call for all the residencies. We do all the tooth call, like the, the general dentistry call. We do all the pediatrics call. They don't take call here. General dentistry is starting to take call here, but but there's not a general dentist on call every night. So technically, we're still taking all general dental call, pediatrics call. Yes, literally last week, there was a little kid screaming in my ear while we were draining an infection. It's ha It happens probably once every two months. And yes, screaming at the top of your lungs, in your face, in the emergency room, even with sedation, right? Mild sedation they, they can do in the ED. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you might not hear for a few days out of your left ear, but you did it, right? I, I don't know. Um, endodontics is, is really cool, but you have to do a GPR year, and then you do the two-year specialty. It's that's one thing. Perio it is 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 interesting, I, I think. And then different residencies of perio are interesting. They're placing a lot of implants now. Um, I don't like how at certain dental schools they're teaching students that only periodontists place implants. It's not true, and. Uh, so I don't really appreciate that because it's, you know, it's a team effort here um, and, a, and a teamwork oriented specialty, uh, you know, field in this, in this profession. But um, orthodontics was really cool too. Orthodontics was fun. I really did enjoy, honestly, ortho, ortho in our class in dental school. Um, it went well. So, yeah. Uh, the next one is just a follow-up to the CBC exam. Um, does the score expire? No, no. And, and I answered that before. It's all good. But also general dentistry is really cool because you can do a certain amount of many different, you could do root canals. You might be able to do simple cases of, you know, straightening teeth, for example, maybe not all the time. Most of the time, not. You could do a lot more damage if you're give, giving out clear aligners as a general dentist. Just saying. Um, that's why it's a three-year orthodontic specialty. You can do, you know, root canals. You can do some simple implants you could do crowns right prosthodontics is the I think three year specialty in restorative putting crowns on dentures in but you can do some of that as a general dentist for restorative measures so general dentistry I was was probably my second place thing after oral surgery um and yeah the, the score I don't think um expires um next one is are research publications needed for getting into a DDS program for international dentists for international dentists, that, that's a that's a difficult question. I don't think they are. I really don't think they are. It's general. It's, and this goes for most things. Even just getting a job, it's developing a relationship with the 
program director with the with the attendings of the program. We have an international program here. Uh, oh my God, the attendings are awesome. They're, they're they're a lot of fun. Very, I like them all. Very nice people. It's going to the dental school and helping out, working in the clinic, getting to know them, and then applying from there. Um, the next one is what is a work workload like during residency, and how do you manage the work life balance? Oh, the work life balance is definitely tipped more to the the work side. I'll tell you that right now. Um, you some residencies you they're supposed to get post call when you're on call. You're on for a twenty four plus hour period, right? And the next day, you're legally supposed to get that day off. That's called post call. Some residencies don't get post call. Most residencies do. Um, and so the work life, and then you spend most of that day maybe sleeping or, you know, catching up on paperwork or whatever that day. Um, some weeks, my intern year, I've worked over a hundred hours, many weeks of the year when I, when I was an intern, uh, because you're working six days a week, you get one. So I was working Sunday on call and the first year we didn't get post call. So Sunday through late Friday night. Um, it's a lot of work. That's all work. And then I only had Friday nights and Saturdays to friends, family time, you know, um, and nights when you finally get out. So you're supposed to get more time as you go through residency. I'm still taking five primary or first calls a month. Um, I could, I could explain what the difference is if you'd like, but, um, some residencies, you get more time back as you go through than others. Uh, the next question is, what should I do to improve my acceptance rate for applying to a pass for ortho? Pass for ortho. Oh, I wish Sean was on. He'd be able to answer this much more, much more directly. You should try and go see programs if you can. Get an idea of what they're like. They can get an idea of what you like. They do have externships for ortho, but I think it's kind of like you go in for uh, a day, kind of thing, not, not for a full week. I, I don't know. Cause I'm, I'm not in ortho. I don't know the, the exact specifics. I know a lot of people get involved in research for ortho. They, wow. Jeez. I do have eyebrows guys. I'm just really realizing this ring light that I got from here. It looks like, Oh my God. <laughs> Is he on chemo? No, that's not, that's not funny. I've, I've, I've been made fun of for not having eyebrows and they asked if I was a cancer patient before, believe it or not. But anyway, besides the point, yes, I have eyebrows, but um, your ortho research seems to be a very big thing for applying to ortho residency. So if you want to increase your, I didn't like, they get really cutthroat about who's doing research with what attending and can I get in on that project and stuff? I, I didn't really like that, but that seems to be uh, predominant in, in ortho and research is very important when applying to residencies. Um, next one is what is your take on people saying dentistry is saturated? Depends on where you go. It is very saturated in York, the tri-state area, California, in certain areas and in other areas in the Midwest, they can't find dentists for sometimes hundreds of miles. Um, you got to find your niche. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like I said, if you're into knitting, knit, if you're into painting, paint, art, music you like to play the piano play the it's same thing in dentistry you know you'll find you really like to do root canals you'll find you just love to make the nicest dentures for patients you might love to teach uh to to treat geriatric patients you know patients that are very old um you find your niche and own it be the best that you can at it enjoy it find what excites you do the best you can at it and that's what you're going to look forward forward to doing every single day of the week and Therefore, where things are saturated, you're going to go where what your thing is, is less saturated, right? If that is the case. But um, I think that's a generalized question and it's what you make of it. What's the best advice you can give us to relating to the process of applying to dental school? It's exactly that. It's cooking. It's doing what you love. It's going to help you get through literally Mental health wise, it will also help you get through school. You need to keep that time for yourself. Um, on on a, a random you know, Friday night, I'll you know after a long week, it was a good week. I'll have, I'll have a nice cold beer in the shower. That was that's another one thing I like to do. A nice cold beer, maybe get some good music on in the shower, and just let the hot water hit your back. Another, that's another thing. Back issues 
hot. I, I blast the hot water. I get out. And, and my friend, my girlfriend, I asked me, she's like, why do you have a rash on your back? And it's like this, I open the door and steam just like floods into the apartment. Right. Um, it's a little stuff like just, you got to enjoy the little moments. And as you go, especially in oral surgery, it's the little moments that, that get you through, right? Stick to what you're passionate about, bring it out, put it on your resume, maybe not the shower beer and the steam and, <laughs> but playing an instrument. They love that. The little, the little hobbies, the, the things that really make you, you own that, you know, stick to it and, and really let your flower blossom. Uh, the next question is, does your program support female applicants? Because some programs historically only match male residents. Last year, we accepted two girls. One was a boy. This year, one one girl, two boys. Yes, we have girls in our program. A chief last year, girl, just, just graduated. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one is doing orthodontist residency worth it? And is, is it similar to oral surgery residency in terms of workplace and years? Um, yes, no, and no. First question was, is orthodox residency worth it? Absolutely. My buddy Sean, Law I mean, it's, it's work. Of course it's work. It's, it's teaching too. um, everything as far as what I know now. Yes, it is worth it. Again, find your niche within that specialty. Sometimes figure out where you're going to work, who you're going to work for, make it enjoyable. Don't settle for anything less than what you love and are excited to do every single day that you wake up. And that's for every day of your life not just dental school or residency. The next, so that was three quick questions. The second one um, was, is it the same like work intensive as oral surgery residency in the same timeline? No, not the same timeline. Orthodontics residency, like 99% of them are three years, okay? Also, they don't take call and they're not paid. Most ortho residencies, you have to pay to go there. Oral surgery, we are paid. Generally, because we take call for the hospital, handle emergencies and whatnot. Um, oral surgery is not three years. It's four or I don't have six fingers over here, but it's four or six. Six years as an additional two years because they get their MD. And this should open up another bunch of questions, I'm sure. Um, the last question that I got so far, um, we'll read this one. Um, you speak about community a, a lot, and I'm wondering... What, if any, would you like to be able to do to assist or provide your skill set within the community that serves patients in the underserved or uninsured demographics outside the actual practice? So sure, sure. Well, maybe someone could kind of like have some confidence and address the fact that these insurance companies aren't covering things. Okay, so that's the first thing. And what I what what I, I'm really really passionate about this topic. Because everyone wants to point the fingers at doctors these days. Everyone wants to point the finger at dentists these days. But the fact is, is these insurance companies aren't reimbursing for treatments that have already been rendered. They're cutting back the amount of reimbursement for treatments. They're saying, oh, well, this wasn't actually a full bony impaction. We're going to call this. You're you're not the, like, you know, I, I, I could go on for days and days and days. So we need to really talk about ASDA. Um, ASDA is the primary club throughout dental school. They're super involved with advocacy for dentistry as a profession. Then you have the ADA. I think politically, unfortunately, I see a lot of people getting in because they will have politics. They love attention. They love to be popular. I think that's the wrong, not necessarily entirely the wrong, but remember what the roots are of what these organizations were created for, to bring the profession in, a, in the right direction, a brighter future than the past. No one's addressing these things. You got to address the root cause, right? Like these underserved areas, underserved communities, under, underserved populations, many of them have insurance. Why isn't insurance paying for these things that the dentist is telling them that they need, right? Um, I could go on that. So it's a very big pipe dream, right? But I really would like to, this is why I make content. I want to educate. I want to gain a commute, my own community, not necessarily about me, but us. So we could change dentistry for the future. And I think it involves passing on the right message and leading each other together on the right precedent that this is for, this is for everyone. Um, so that's one thing there's there. And I, I could go on and other things about like community and other underserved areas and such, but essentially that's, you know, there's, there's a bigger thing that isn't really getting addressed here that that's, I think it's going to involve a lot of politics and, and such. So, there's another thing I'm sure you've heard. DSOs are 
it's dental service organization. The it's kind of like how hospitals are buying up outpatient practices in the medical side of health healthcare. And I see we got another question that came in. In dentistry, DSOs are buying up individual dental practices, and then they you the dentists lose a bit of autonomy. And what happens is the dentist that sells out to the to the DSO gets a big paycheck. And then what they'll say is, well, you don't have to retire right away. Stay on. And they'll give them the same percentage that the dentist was making while he worked there and owned it. But then the next dentist that signs on, say it's it's 44, 45%. The next dentist that signs on, just in just for example, they'll give them 44%. And then the next one, they'll give them 40% of what they produce, right? Like 40% of production, like what they make as, as far as the salary goes. Just this is just very basic. And then how does this pan out? The younger the dentist on the time that signs on, the percentage gets less and less and less and less. And remember, that dentist now works for the practice. They aren't able to sell the practice anymore because it's not there. So they never get that big payout when they want retirement to come. They're getting less and less percentages. And now remember, years ago, dentists were just able to, right at fresh out of dental school, open their own dental practice. They didn't have massive loans in 1972. But in 2022 and 23, today, we... They're, they're massive loans, right? So how is how does this pan out when it becomes 2050, for example, and these dentists have loans up to here, but the amount of money they're making each year is down here because it's going less and less and less, and, re and insurance reimbursements are less and less. How does this pan out as it go? Does it work? I don't think so. The math doesn't add up to me. Um, so that's one thing with, with DSOs that I like to keep an eye on. Um, the next one is a two-part question. Do you think you would have been happy as a general dentist? That's yes, I, I would have made it. I would have made it happy. I would have done extensive training and courses in the procedures that I like to do. I would have. I still am. I really want to get in. So this kind of ties into the underserved area stuff and then addressing insurance companies and such. I, I like to make a lot of content to, again, educate, mentor, but then also we're, we're building a community here so we could change the future. I think change the future. I could be wrong. I'm more likely, there's only a 10% chance of success in this big pipe dream. However, um, in general dentistry, you're able to get more quickly. If you understand business marketing, you treat patients in the community very well. You're very good at networking. You have a more quick chance of getting into entrepreneurship or practice development and whatnot. Um, in terms of, in some States, you don't need to do residency. You could just start working in New York. You need to do one year residency in order to work. Right. But oral surgery is four to six years either way. So it's prolonging it, right? Um, I'm going to get into it one day. But what I mean is I would like to help other dentists open practices. I would like to not form a DSO, but I would like to form an opportunity for dentists to open their own practice, to gain their own revenue. I would like to build my own project that we can af afford and help dentists open their own practice, for example, but not take away their percentages. This is a very abstract thought. I want to make money through other side projects, companies and stuff, and, you know, working my own oral surgery office, but I'd like to help dentists open their own thing um, and not take a cut for them, for example, right? It's an abstract thought. I don't know if it's possible. We'll get there eventually. Uh, the second part is, do you recommend dental school if someone isn't interested in pursuing a career as a general dentist and would like to specialize? Yes, but you do have to be realistic. You do have to be realistic. And you can't just go all gung-ho like, oh, I'm going to be the next big orthodontist. If you don't like general dentistry, there's a good chance you might be one. So you got to master dentistry before you master a specialty. It's just the truth, right? You got to like it all. And guess what? If you don't like it, all your colleagues are doing it, right? In oral surgery, you get referrals from general dentists. In endo, you're getting referrals from general dentists. You're, you know, so you got to be able to be a team player and, and work together with your colleagues. Um, what is the difference between the four-year and six-year residency program? And what can the oral surgeons in those respective residencies do procedure-wise? And are there any differences? The six-year residency has an extra two years because you're spending that time in medical school getting your MD. There are no difference in procedures that any oral surgeons can do between you. All oral surgeons can do the same procedures. Someone just asked me today, like, so Brendan, like, then why do the six-year? Well, I mean, you're getting your MD. You have a very 
very large fundamental understanding of the medical based sciences and side of healthcare, um, which is very beneficial, which, I mean, I still get that in a four-year residency as well. I just haven't gone formally through medical school. Um, although we do have to pass the CBSC, which is technically, it's like a, it's like half the questions of step one. It's like step one. Um, why get, why do the six year there? Why get the MD? The six year program, when you get the MD, it can help you apply to fellowships. If say you want to go into head and neck, if you want to go into cosmetic surgery, there's a surgeon that graduated five, six, seven years, five or six years ago. He went to Oklahoma to do a cosmetics fellowship for a year and then come, comes back. And now he does breast implants. He does BBLs. He does tummy tucks. He does a lot of cosmetic procedures now because he got his, his MD in the six-year program and then applied there. Um, it can be beneficial for that. However, there is a fine opportunity, just as much so if you're a four-year resident, to go into a fellowship, right? But it may be a, a more seamless process if you have your MD already. Uh, another thing is if you're applying to academics, having an MD may be beneficial. If you're really, really into research, having an MD might be beneficial because you know they love the, those letters on the end of their name on the research papers, right? So that's my take that I've taken in from all these different sources over the years. The number one thing I, I think if you want to go into fellowships, that's what the six year might help you for. Uh, the next one is, how do you know that a CE course is legitimate and worth it? How will you go about continuing your education after residency? Actually, just last week, there was the Amos meeting. It's like the American Academy of Wellness and Facial Surgeons. Uh, it was in California, and uh, there are courses there. There, The Greater New York Dental Meeting, there are meetings there. There are oral surgery meetings that you could go to to, to further learn, right? Um my biggest thing is I want to work in a practice where I'm not the only guy there. And I want to be there with, with other partners and we can learn from each other. We can go to different meetings and such, right? Come back and teach and work together. I think it's really important. Again, team teamwork-based atmosphere, environment, office, et cetera. Um, yeah. uh, the next one is, what do you suggest, in your opinion, should uh, international dentists get into? A general dentistry or a residency? You need to go to dental school before you apply to residency in the United States. So um, you have to find a dental school that does have an internationally based program. Most most of them will have like, it's two years in their international based program. And then from there, see if you can apply. Um, some programs don't take international students. That's how you have to do it. Um, I think that was the last question, but if anybody has any more questions, I'll leave it open for a couple of more minutes to see if any other questions would come in, and then we can end the session if that's the case. Um, sure, sure. I'm here for you guys. Yep. So um, in response to that, the international, it says, no, there are no, there are programs which allow internationals to get into a residency directly. I don't know of any. And if it is a residency, it's not necessarily a, well, they'll find out for themselves. So I'm just going to wait a minute, see if any other last minute questions pop up. Or if anyone just wants to ask directly, like unmute and make it a little more interactive. That's cool too. <laughs> Crystal, what are you interested in looking into? Um, you right now in your path, I'm a junior biology major. Um, right now I've been, uh, shadowing like general dentists and pediatrics. I really do like pediatrics, Excellent. even though a lot of people say they don't like it. I kind of really like it. So that's where it's standing right now, but we'll see. Cause I know, um, a lot of people that I've talked to say that like your, um, your interest changes once you like explore everything. And the only one I've really explored is pediatrics. So that's where I'm at. Yeah. <laughs> Are you, so you're, you're third year right now. So yeah. you just started third, uh, third year of college. I so do. now you're going to be applying after. Next cycle. The year. So yeah, after in uh, June, next cycle. Okay. We'll yeah. keep in touch, obviously. Right. 
I have one of my best friends in dental school, uh, Shrada. She went to, uh, well, she did pediatrics at Stony Brook after dental school. She's in Connecticut now. I'll get you in touch. Anything you need to know about pediatrics, what you should be doing in dental school, et cetera. When you get there, I'll let, I'll put you two in touch. Easy. Thank you. <laughs> of course. Of course. I know, I know, I know plenty of pediatric dentists, but she's, I'm, I'm close with, you know. Have you taken the DAT yet? Uh, no, I'm planning to by like January. Yeah. Awesome. Um, awesome. That's a great idea. If, if you can, something I did that I found was very helpful. The one section on the DAT, if you don't know, is the PAT. That's not something you've ever learned, study, seen before even, right? Mm -hmm. So what I did was over my winter break in, in college, what I was like, why don't I just start studying? But why don't I study this weird section, right? So I studied that alone, just that, like just to focus on, let's figure out what this is. Let's get it down, you know, digest it a little bit. And then what I did was after I, I graduated, I took a gap year. After I graduated, I took the DAT about a month after I graduated. So I was like, that month will be for the biology, the math, you know, the quantitative reasoning, the reading section, the orgo section, the general, you get it, right? All those, let's say we've seen it all before through college, right? Your biology major, I was chemical biology, same thing, bio, whatever. Say that, you know, but let's learn something. So maybe Thanksgiving break, I don't know, maybe early on. I would recommend just go through that a little bit. Maybe have a long weekend, start looking into that a little bit. Let's get that out of the way. And then when you start studying, it's like now you're reviewing everything. You're not seeing something for the first time that's new. You see? What did you do uh, during your gap year? Did you Do you recommend taking one? Honestly, I actually do recommend taking a gap year. The reason being is, so so Crystal, look, I, I'm I'm confident you're going to, hit a home run DAT is going to be great. And you have, you have a roadmap and look, I'm also available to just DM me questions and stuff. I'll help you through the process. Right. But if you don't get the score you need, or you don't get in, whatever the gap year, I actually recommend, I found through dental school, we had several, not several. We had, so the class was 44, I would say over a dozen. So over a quarter of our class were, they were finance majors working in investment bank and said, I don't want to do this anymore. There was a girl that was a pianist. She was like, she, she went to like Juilliard, like majored in piano. And she was like, you know, I kind of had enough of this. I want to do dentistry. She did it. She was in my school class. There was another, one of my buddies, he's at UConn oral surgery now, Ian. He was working for several years in his parents' um, outside business. It, it was in like dry cleaners or something. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Worked there for several years, came back to school, and then did all of it. I found that these, these students had a much broader scope of life rather than the little meticulous like, oh, I got a 92 instead of a 94 kind of mentality, right? Bigger picture. And I think it's a much healthier way to, to look at things in that viewpoint, right? And I think it helps students get through. I took a gap year. I, I'm not saying I looked at things differently, but I worked for – the oral surgeon as a surgical assistant in my gap year. I did a lifeguarding job on the weekends at an assisted living home. And I also lifeguarded at nights during the week at a gym for a G free gym membership. And it allowed me, the lifeguarding allowed, I, I also lifeguarded through dental school, which I highly recommend. I would do weekends um, because you could sit there. It, it was a four foot deep pool. No one's drowning, right? So like I was studying the entire time, studying through dental school. It was early, seven o'clock on Sunday mornings. Um, and then I would work out after cause it gave you, gave me a free gym membership. And then it would give me like 80 bucks every two weeks for groceries and gas money and stuff. Um, highly recommend that so you can study, but, um, doing all, I, I was reading books during my gap year on, on finances and how to market yourself and learning about dentistry for that matter, how to interview, how to win friends and influence people by Dale Carnegie. I think is the number one book you should read for life. I don't know if you've read it before. Anyone's read it before. Highly recommend. It will also, it literally has how to interview, how to crush the interview. There's like a section in there on that. Highly recommend it. Um, what was, was there anything else about the gap year? So yeah, I, I do recommend it because it kind of gives you, you get to get, in, get, in, get immersed in life in your gap year, right? You finish college. I'm going to find a job, right? I need, I need to do something this year. I need to learn. You get to learn about yourself and you get to learn about the world you're in in your gap year. If you're going from high school to college, to dental school, to residency, when have you been thrown in the deep end of life, right? And then I do, you do see sometimes dentists, when they get into it, it's, you know what I mean? So. 
Um, there was a question. It says like, um, what advice would you, could you offer for a dental school interview if you had like any specific advice? Yeah, the so dental school interviews. Everyone's gonna ask, like tell me a little something about yourself. I would keep that to about a minute, minute and a half. I would tell a story of your life. Um, I'll I'll give you the big. So right away, the biggest thing about an interview is it's not a test. It's not a multiple choice. It's not short. It's not a test. It's a conversation. And it's very important to understand conversational skills, right? You don't need to study conversational skills. I think it's very important to learn how to look up just common interview questions and then learn how that relates to you tell, by, by telling a story and everything. And then I would also understand your strengths and weaknesses. And whenever you're answering the questions, it's really good to mold the answer towards your strengths, right? Like I... I'm excited to be in a team atmosphere again, blah, blah, blah. And also recognize your weaknesses. Like I pack way too much on my plate, right? Very hungry. I am, you know, I work out a bit, very hungry. But during the day, I pack way too much on my plate and I don't get to it. Sometimes I don't end up getting to see my friends on weekends because I didn't get the, the workout in or finish the, I wanted to get two papers in this weekend and study for that exam on Monday rather than what, you know, whatever it may be. And then relate that back to strengths. I like to, another thing is that I'm finding out over the years, it's been, it's been two years since I've interviewed, but pick strengths and weaknesses that other people can relate to, you know? And then, you know, like everyone's always too busy, right? Everyone's always too busy. In your mind, you might not be busy to other people, but in your mind, you're busy, right? Every doctor that you're meeting with on interview. Is, so pick that as like, figure out a, a strength. I'm busy, but I like to prioritize things. So I get a lot done in a short amount of time. And then maybe pick a weakness side to being busy where it's like, sometimes I don't get to see my friends. Sometimes I don't get to everything on, on the weekend or the weeknight or whatever. Everyone can relate to something like that. Right. And then that's a conversation start. Um, someone also asked if you could rename like the books that you talked about, about the interview, the one that had the interview. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Um, it's How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. That is, I think, the number one book everyone should read, regardless of profession, career, interests. It's just, it's how to connect with other people. It's really that simple. I've read it three, four, or five times maybe. And I would read it again if I had time. <laughs> you can even find it on podcast and listen to it while you read it if you, if you have, I don't know. I, I found that that's, it helps you kind of keep a good pace going when you read rather than distracting, getting distracted. Um, another, other books that I would recommend for prior to interviews. Um, it's good to do stuff that are self-help books. It's also really good to podcasts. Excellent. Look at podcasts of people interviewing other people, right? People that are in dentistry, maybe. Um, I have my podcast. Most of the time I do. In fact, you could always anyone on here can just DM me on Instagram. If you want to set up like going in on interview questions and whatnot and answer, you know, Q and a session, we can do that. Um, I really want to be as accessible as I can, just like we, we, we did here, Crystal, you know, uh, for dental showers and planning other events, talks, any, any one-on-one -on -one sessions. I do like to record and edit to the pot, the podcast and YouTube channel for, you know, other people that might have similar questions. Um, there are other books. I wouldn't put any other book right away that's geared towards dental school or dentistry. Like for example, Keith Ferrazzi wrote a book. It's called never eat alone. It's more business based and team managing a team, which can be helpful for dental school and residency and college. Uh, actually it would be very helpful college because it's about networking. It's about how to network. Um, it's very good, but I wouldn't directly say like, that's going to help you on the interview, for example. Uh, there's a question I think we missed, but um, it says a lot of dentists say schools look for diversity, but what exactly does that mean? Um, what does diversity mean to you? Diversity to a lot of schools, I think they, they want different backgrounds of their dental school class. People that have come from different cultures and different backgrounds. Um, I think it's a great idea because it's like, it's like the United States. You know, we're known as like that melting pot country over the years where I think it's a great idea. However, I do think it's very important to consider all applicants based on, you know, you know, like, like their, their, their credentials, if you will, for the positions, like 
I, I don't, I don't know. I don't have the answer to this, but is it, it's very important to have a diverse, culturally diverse people in a dental school or any college, what have you. But I think it's also important to consider that, you know, if certain student people or, you know, demographics have gotten 99, you know, you know, high nineties and stuff, GPA, whatever it may be, you know, like, like 4.0s, but then like, now we want a diverse class and now you're taking maybe a three, five, whatever, whatever that school is looking at. I don't know the answer to this, but how does that kind of translate to your school status? Or I, I don't know. I don't know. How does that relate to, to the school's importance, you know, precedent principle? I don't know. I don't know how this pans out. You know, we know diversity is absolutely necessary, but to say that, you know, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I, I don't know how this works as far as, um, he went to Harvard and got a 99, but he's this and this. I don't know. I think that was the last question. Um, I think we can wrap up if nobody else has any other questions. But um, let me see. I'm just going to wait another minute, you know, questions come up. Yeah, and I'm always available. You can find me at Dr. Gallagher. It's, the, you know, the, the handle is at Dr. Gallagher on Instagram. It's at Dr. Gallagher underscore on TikTok. I, I do try and make different content for different platforms. Um, like LinkedIn is, is very different. TikTok, I don't always post everything onto Instagram. On Instagram, I don't put the mentoring videos. I try and alternate mentoring videos with like the day in life one. I don't know. I don't put those always on other on other platforms. Um, yeah, I'm always already available. Just DM me any questions that you have, really. I'll get back to you. The audio message is great. I can get back to you the detail. You're not having the questions nowadays on Instagram. Yes, I am. I do it at the end of the month. I always do like the end of July, the end of December, but we are coming up on it. It's the 27th. So I will be having it. I think Sunday is the 1st of October. I'll probably do the Q and a session on Sunday. I'm on call. Yeah. Not that, the case space questions. Oh yeah, dude. Cause I've been super busy. I've been super busy. Um, I do. I need to make more time for it. I really do. Sure. Sure. I'll, I'll put it in here. Okay. I'll just um, wrap it up while you type it in the chat, but um, thank you, Dr. Gallagher for uh, speaking on our platform today. Uh, your knowledge is very valuable and everyone had a great time listening to you speak. Um, if anybody has any questions, again, Dr. Gallagher just dropped his um, Instagram handle in the chat. So if you go give him a follow, reach out to him. If you do need anything, he is available for you. Um, and I would like to thank everyone who did come on uh, live today. Thank you for your questions. Um, and there might be a qu attendance quiz. I'm still figuring that out if we're still going to do one. But just check our Instagram um, and our link tree. And then um, it should be posted there if there is one. But yeah, thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you.